sky blue. Well, you are. Doing jazz this week. I did say I was going to do electrical noises. I guess I'll push the doo doo boo boo doo Game of Thrones Season 4, Episode 5. The first of his name. Pause for dramatic effect. <laughs> Pause for funny quip by you. You usually start before I come in with the quips. You usually say something, and that's when my brain starts spinning. Like, oh, I can make a quip about that. You can't just leave me out to dry. I'm not that creative. Wow. So we're finally getting somewhere here. Uh, Aaron, let's go back to that event in third grade when you pissed your pants in front of class. That's Teddy. That wasn't me. Oh, that is Teddy. I always confuse you two. It's hard to tell you apart sometimes. Well, I'm a, I'm a monkey, so... I thought you were a teddy bear. Okay. And so did Stu. Let's just review the episode, huh? How about that? Straight to business. Enough I like it. You. Now, I do think some people get confused by this, too, when they say first of his name. And at first, I was also confused, but it means that Tommen is the first Tommen, king of Westeros. And this is the coronation to what could be the worst reign in the history of Westeros. It's not the worst. There's been some pretty awful kings. Name one. Joffrey. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, we see Tommen get crowned. He is the new king of Westeros. And right here, he's good, you know. Obviously, in later seasons, he gets his uh, brainwashed by pretty much everybody trying to get into Tommen's little brain. Such a sweet, innocent kid. It's a shame what people did to him, but here, you know. Great rookie season. Then he turns out to be a boss. Well, no, he's a good prospect. Very good prospect, yeah. But, you know, the coach died pretty yeah, much. Yeah, when your head coach... <laughs> yeah. Talk about head coach getting fired. Yeah. When he dies. Gets fired at. And then you bring in Cersei, who's mm. the Isaiah Thomas of Westeros. <laughs> Oh, come on. Yeah. That's that's not fair. <laughs> well, what's interesting here, too, is that he shares that look with Marjorie, and we know Marjorie was working her magic in the previous episode. Oh, she's creeping. She is creeping on him, and the way that Cersei kind of walks in between them, it's a great shot, and it just shows that she is the physical human obstacle to her becoming the most powerful, one of the most powerful people in Westeros. But then Cersei kind of has this moment of understanding that if Tommen is going to be successful in his rule, Marjorie needs to be somebody that can be his backbone. And that's very interesting that Cersei is willing to put aside her ego for moments like this. Yeah, she realizes that there's a lot more at stake here. And I always like when she acknowledges who Joffrey was. She does it a few times. It kind of builds her character more where she's still a mother first. And I know you've we've argued about this point numerous times where I think Cersei really does love her children. And sometimes the clouds are ju a judgment, especially with Joffrey. And I feel like kind of her not trying not to make that same mistake again where she let Joffrey pretty much turn into a monster. Here she's realizing Tommen's going to need other people to help him besides her and Tywin. Yeah, they always say that a mother, no matter what their son or daughter does, the mother is always going to have their back. And to go back to your point about her loving her children, I think she loves them as extensions of herself, not as individuals with their own ambitions and personalities. It's just little Cersei's that she can control. I think she's scared of what Tommen could become because of what Joffrey was, and that's why she's kind of employing the help of Marjorie, saying, hey, I'm, even though he will be easier for us, but... Yeah, and I kind of <laughs> brings up, oh, uh, brings up marrying Tommen. Marjorie's like, oh, I didn't even think of that. <laughs> yeah, she, she knows how to play coy so well. Oh, Tom, who's that? Yeah. I never even... Oh, his name's oh, Tom. That, oh, that's, okay. okay. I didn't... Okay. I thought that was the other Lannister that was killed by uh, Rickard Karstark. Oh, never mind. Yeah, but yeah, I'm, I'm down to help. I'm down for the call. Gee, I don't know. I mean, so many crazy... All right, I guess. <laughs> and then she calls her sister again. So she's like, what did I say last season? Bitch really wants to get strangled, huh? Yeah, she's just <laughs> barking up the wrong tree. But it's, it's so fun. Where I wish they would have touched on it more in season six. But the battles that they have between each other are very fascinating. Because it is the old school and the new school. And I always say Marjorie's a more compassionate, probably a bit smarter. I think they're both great characters. I mean, it's fun to have them pit against each other because they're both, like you said, they're kind of the same where they're trying to put themselves in their own best position and they go about it in different ways. So it's always nice to see them kind of spar verbally and with their maneuverings. And the news of Tommen's coronation has traveled all the way to the east, all the way to Marine. And here we have Daenerys' war council and they're kind of mulling over their options of whether to strike now while the Lannisters are vulnerable, while the War of the Five Kings is kind of winding down, or to stay in Marine and to rule, build something there. And I always love the scenes with Daenerys' War Council because they're interesting to get all these different opinions, a team of rivals, if you will, with Daenerys acting as their leader. You got Dario taking navies and stuff like that, unsanctioned. Hey, you know, you gotta, you gotta stand out from the crowd. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta... What's his excuse? I heard you like ships. That is true. I took their navy. 
She's always talking about ships, so. She does love her ships. Yeah. You know, it's another thing we always say about, we always talk about, like, stupid tropes in, like, TV and movies. I always, when I was like, everyone leave me. Wait a couple, wait, like, 30 seconds. Not you. Not you. No, except for you, Jorah. Just say that in the beginning. Yeah, everybody leave but Jorah. It's Tywin not as cool. Does, as it. Tywin does it with Tyrion, too. Not you. Yeah, Tywin's is always the best. Yeah, Tywin's is almost, like, it's kind of in his nature. <laughs> but yeah. It always happens where it's like, eh, not you. I eh, could have just said that. I already got up. Now I got to go sit back down. It's showing the room who she trusts the most which is ironic because we know what Jorah did and what's going to happen between them. But just to take it back a little bit, the fact that Barristan is the one who is pushing for a Westerosi invasion, saying that we probably could take King's Landing, even though you you have to take all the Seven Kingdoms. You have to get them all under your rule. This is the time to strike. Well, he's a little delusional, too, in how the common people would accept Daenerys. It's like, oh, all the old houses will flock to your cause. In reality, it's whoever gives you the best chance, whoever they feel, you know, at the end of the day, they want what's best for them. It's not really going off the names. The Targaryens are supposed to be the dynasty in Westeros. That's not enough anymore. It's all about who is perceived to put you in a better situation. It's not necessarily on name, and you hear Jorah correct him on that. Yeah, Jorah's the one pushing back, saying that we shouldn't invade just yet. And Daenerys makes the wise decision to stay in Marine and to rule. And that proves to be, I don't know if it's the correct decision, because maybe they could have taken King's Landing, but when she does get there in Season 7, she's very hesitant to go to King's Landing and just burn it down. She wants to take it in a way that proves that she's more noble, more honorable than previous leaders, that she's not willing to sacrifice civilian lives to get what she wants. And maybe that's a decision she wouldn't make if she left in season four. And it does make sense. I mean, she's still very new to this. I mean, and you've seen what happened in Yunkai and Astapur, where as soon as she left, the old ways kind of resurfaced. And she's got to kind of learn to, to rule. And that's what she says she wants to do. She wants to stay and rule. And it doesn't mean anything if she frees and liberates these people if once she leaves, it's just going to go back to the old ways. Yeah, it's the trials and tribulations of Daenerys. And we also get that with Sansa and Littlefinger arriving at the Vale for the first time. And it's the start of something that could have been magnificent. It could have been such a great relationship. And we keep bringing it up. We keep repeating ourselves. It is cool to hear that history of how Nobody has been able to penetrate the Eyrie because of just the geography. That you can't get up these mountains without sacrificing your entire army. It's just impossible. It's almost like the Battle of Thermopylae. That it's just when you have that tight space and those mountains, you're safe. 300. This is the Eyrie! Yeah, he'll well, kick him out the moon door. All you really need to do is impress the young lord of the dragon, and you get the veil. Yeah, that was, I, I do love that. It was Visenya when she wrote up her... I would have been sold to him. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> it's fucking awesome. Let's do this. Yeah, you can't penetrate it with an army, but you can fly up. <laughs> get Littlefinger's helicopter. <laughs> yeah, and it's a nice one, like how Liza recognizes Sansa, and how you kind of like remember, oh yeah, Liza is Kat's sister, because she's very different from Kat, <laughs> and very horny. <laughs> yeah, haven't seen her for two years, too. Yeah, so it's been building up. Yeah. I, she I loves met, her some little finger, man. Yeah. Little finger was probably so sore walking out of that castle the first time. <laughs> Gee, now I got to go all the way back to King's Landing. And then we see little Robin as well, that sickly little boy who just has no filter. Oh, I heard the Lannisters uh, beheaded your brother, beheaded your dad, beheaded your, your mom. Uh, that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> It does suck. Yeah, yeah, you're right, Robin. Oh, thanks, nice for to the, me- thanks for the toy, Uncle Peter. <laughs> I'm going to throw it out this fucking moon door. <laughs> well, I mean, if it's a, if it's a bird toy, you got to throw it out the moon door. You can't yeah. resist that. Yeah, get him a drone. Get him a drone. <laughs> yeah. And we also have Liza revealing that it was Littlefinger that told her to poison John and send a letter, letter to Cat. So it's kind of just Some showing. good exposition here. Yeah. You <laughs> told me to write the letter in cursive <laughs> to, your, to my sister. A little on the nose, but... It's, but it is a big reveal because as the yeah. audience, you're thinking, I know what Littlefinger's capable of, but he did that? Oh, yeah. He caused all of this fucking chaos. That's I feel like it kind of could fly over like a new viewer's head. If you, if you talk to a casual viewer at this moment, they'd probably be like, oh, what's, who's John? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> who's John Aaron, right, yeah. But uh, yeah, it just shows the mastermind that is Littlefinger, where thanks to him, we get the first three seasons and more going forward. The deed is done, faded into nothing. Only speaking of it can make it real. Ravens. We need to send ravens. 
And that's the genius of George's writing, too. It's it's so many events that happen off screen that are just so important and that you have to pay attention to hear these lines, to read them in the books. And Littlefinger, just the ever the mastermind. And they agree to get married. And she says that she is going to scream while her husband makes love to her. And God, is she faking it? <laughs> no, I disagree. I, I think Littlefinger got that bomb. You'll have what she's, <laughs> yeah. You're going to have what she's having? <laughs> you think Littlefinger hangs dog? He's got some moves, yeah. Dude, Little Finger's dog. a smooth dude, you know. I always say he's very handsome. But yeah, Liza Aaron, confirmed screamer. Yeah, the worst. Ravens. We need to send ravens. So many scenes in this episode are characters discussing their futures and their plans. And in this scene, we have one of the most important scenes that involves the fate of House Lannister and how they're going to operate moving forward. It's this conversation between Cersei and Tywin. And just one of the funniest lines of the the episode of the season is when they're discussing when Tommen can get married. And Cersei's saying, well, we need to give him time to mourn his brother. Marjorie needs time to mourn her husband. And Tywin with his dry sense of humor. After we've allowed Tommen the appropriate time to mourn his brother... And Marjorie to mourn her husband. A fortnight? That seems reasonable. Well, you know what they say about millennials in Fortnite, right? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Holy shit. That's... I'm thinking the Lannister minds are dried up, and your jokes might be dried up too, my friend. Holy Moses. You know, it was right there for me. <laughs> I feel like I could have ordered it a little better, connected the dots, but... That was low-hanging fruit. Is it good? You enjoying it? You know. Was it worth it? Probably not. <laughs> Do I have any regrets? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> couple. Just a couple. <laughs> what do you think about this change, though, about the Lannisters, their minds drawing up, that they have no more gold? I think it serves as a story to set up the conflict with the Iron Bank that we never really see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it serves the story that never is fulfilled. It makes it an easier decision when Stannis and Davos meet with them to kind of be like, hey, you know, the Lannisters owe you all this money. Why not join Stannis? kind of deal. Yeah. And I guess later on it makes it easier to for them to abandon Castle Rock because it's really useless at this point. I don't know if they were thinking that far ahead at this particular moment, but I don't know. It's It worked out for them in that case. Yeah, so it's not nothing I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. But it kind of takes a little bit away from the power of the Lannisters. It does show some ver- vernal vernal holy shit. I'm all over the place today. Vulnerability. 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 Well, come on, sound yes. it out. Yes. Vulner- they're vulnerable. Yes. The Lannisters are very vulnerable. Couldn't have said it any better myself, no matter how many moment. tries you gave me. Could you have? Yeah, I mean, it's a change that people have argued over, but I think you're right. And it puts them in a position where Cersei is once again trying to prove that she does have the family legacy in mind. And she proves that in season seven, too, when she's able to pay back the Iron Bank, something that Tywin Lannister wasn't necessarily able to do. And he talks about how you have to make alliances. It's going back to the Godfather. Keep your friends close, put your enemies closer. You taught me in this room. He taught me, keep your friends close, put your enemies closer. So it makes sense to have that alliance with the Tyrells because they are their true rivals. The Starks were their rivals on the battlefield, but now it's, it's more political. It's more about the financial powers that they both wield. And I always love these scenes with Tywin and one of his children. Each relationship brings something new to the table, and it's always fun to further explore that because there's such a... Say what you will about the Linus, there's, there's so many different dynamics going on, on with that family where, where it's nice to kind of get more information about their particular relationships with each other because they're all so different, but kind of the same in a lot of ways. Yeah, you would think that Cersei would know that Tywin kind of hates Tyrion as well. Well, Cersei's telling him what he wants to, he- what she thinks he wants to hear at this point. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Because he's like, yeah, I'll marry Loras. <laughs> also, with Tywin talking about, I can't discuss the details of the trial. So honorable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, he- <laughs> Cersei's like, I respect that. But I just want you to know Tyrion did it. You started wars to protect this family. Turned your back on Jamie for refusing to contribute to its future. What does Tyrion deserve for lighting that future on fire? One of the funniest lines, too, where Arya is reciting her list of names in front of the Hound. The Hound is like, are you... I'll just play the clip. Would you shut up? 
I can't sleep until I say the names. The names of every fucking person in Westeros. What he proves in this episode is that you can't win an argument with this guy. He's got an answer for everything. Yeah, I love when she finally says the hound. He's like, what? The hound. I think he kind of respected it, though. Yeah. I see you. It's like, all right. Got some balls on you, kid. Touche, Arya. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll get back to them later in the episode. And this is a scene, too, where Liza is sitting down with Sansa for the first time, and she's bringing her lemon cakes, and she's talking about the history of her family, of her growing up in the Riverlands with Catelyn. And she kind of hides her resentment towards Catelyn in the beginning of their conversation. It kind of seems innocent. But then it just grows into this irrational hatred of Sansa, as well as Catelyn. She's very mentally unstable. <laughs> yeah, she's very suspicious of Sansa, because I think, well, she obviously knows that Littlefinger preferred Cat to her, even though she always loved Littlefinger. And just talking about all the different things, like she always, Catelyn always wanted, just bringing up how she wanted Brandon Stark, and then he got Ned, and she kind of always got what she wanted, well, in her mind, and it just built into a sort of hatred we even see it i mean if she really loved catelyn she probably would have helped her during the war of the five kings yeah or would have helped her out, not kill john aaron yeah all these things that she did she kind of helped destroy her mm -hmm. sister's house I mean, even sending the letter knowing what that what that would bring yeah. kind of setting them up to join this war and all at the haste of Littlefinger because i'm telling you man Littlefinger knows what he's doing and the knights of the veil vale really would have changed the tide of the war because they kind of have this reputation as great fighters it's those small lines about how Catelyn wasn't allowed to indulge herself in lemon cakes and desserts because she couldn't become fat because she had to be the desirable bride to make a great match with House Tully and another house. She doesn't say it with resentment, but then when she just loses her temper and she starts squeezing Sansa's hands, you finally think Sansa's in a safe place, literally and figuratively, but now she has this other adversary, and she's creepy, man. She creeps me out. Yeah. <laughs> To say the least. Yeah, it's Sansa too. I mean, she's got a lemon cake, she's with her family, the veil's nice this time of year. You know, things are starting to look up, and then you have the crazy Aunt Liza coming out and squeezing your hand and asking you if you banged Littlefinger. It's <laughs> asking if you banged Littlefinger, Tyrion. Well, now you gotta bang sweet Robin. Oh boy. Oh, man. Yeah. Rob <laughs> I don't even bring up like their cousins or anything. It's just so not normal. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's, there's no second thought about it. Yeah, but that scene, it, it's a scene, like I said, that family just creeps me out. They give me the creeps, and she's a perfect actress for that role because you could tell that she has this motherly longing to protect her son, but there's just something that's that was clicked off in Liza when she was born. She was born without some of her marbles. I'm also convinced that Littlefinger is asexual. I don't think after he was spurned by Catelyn that he's really wanted any sort of relation with any other woman. Well, I've always... You say that he's he's got game. It's just something that... He doesn't love to do. Well, no, I've made the argument before that he doesn't really love Catelyn at this point. He's just using her to, to for his own game. Sansa. Catelyn and Sansa. Yeah, yeah. Throughout the books and show where he just sees everyone as a pawn. But I don't even think he has sexual desire because we never see him with any women, right? He kind of coaches them in his brothel. But I think it's similar to Varys in that way. Yeah, I mean, he only has one thing in mind and that's trying to get the Iron Throne. And if you can help him, then he'll use you to his advantage. And if you can't, you're dead to him. Yeah, throw you at the moon door. This is a funny scene, too. A lot of funny moments in this episode when Podrick is trying to ride the horse. So cute, you know? He can't ride his horse. He's cooking the rabbit all wrong. It's like, ah, oh, Pod. That's our Pod. When, when are you going to learn? And for those who haven't read the book, this is Feast for Crows, like 80% of the time. So if you ever want to dive right in. Girl, three and ten, auburn hair. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but it's nice. We get that nice uh, get that moment where he tells her about how he saved Tyrion's life by killing a king Kingsguard, and she can't believe it. It's like, how, how the hell did you kill a Kingsguard? So, yeah, push the spear through the back of his head. Not so innocent now, huh, Brienne? No, yeah, yeah. And that moment, too, where Brienne finally realizes what he's been through. Mm -hmm. The fact that, yeah, he has fought in wars. He fought in one of the greatest battles of the War of the Five Kings, and that he saved Tyrion's life, and... I think she's starting to notice that this man is just... Yeah, very loyal. Yeah. He helps her undo her armor. That look on his face when he sa when she says, get over here. Help me with these straps. He's like, he's just so happy. And I think Podrick might be the most loyal character on the show. I was just wondering to myself the other day, how much did Arya retain from Sirio's training? And I had read some Reddit posts, and a lot of people made the point that it's not necessarily about the physical training, but more the mentality that he bestowed upon her. The ability to escape death, to be resilient things that she keeps with herself throughout the entire show and throughout the books as well when you get into her inner thoughts. And it's almost a tribute to Sirio that she's still practicing 
the water dancing. It's nice too, you just kind of see that old Arya. That's the season one Arya of her practicing. And in, like you said, it's very much a mentality rather than pure strength or the way of the Westerosi knight, which we get a perfect example of when the Hound comes over and antagonizes her. But it kind of leads her to believe that she can be more than she is. And especially with her season five arc and where she is now. And once again, the Hound, you just can't win an argument with this guy. When she's talking about the greatest swordsman who ever lived. I mean, spot the lie. It is so true, man. It says the greatest swordsman who ever lived was killed by Marin fucking Trant. Yeah. So he didn't have a sword. The greatest fucking swordsman ever didn't have a sword. <laughs> and he does that little hound chuckle. I don't yeah. think we heard the hound chuckle before. Syria didn't have a sword. Or am I just a stick? The greatest swordsman ever lived didn't have a sword. <laughs> well, you can make the argument, you know, Marin Trant beat Syria. Arya beat Marin Trant. Ari is better than Serio, yeah. Yeah. I hate when people make those arguments in sports. Well, the Jets beat the Lions. Right. Lions beat the Patriots. Right, so, so the, the Jets, Jets are defending champions. Jets should be better than the Patriots. Yeah, I guess that logic adds up. <laughs> yeah. But it doesn't. Spot the light. Right, when she tries to show her moves to the Hound, and she tries to tap dance, stab him in the stomach, and he teaches her a valuable lesson that Jorah taught to the Dothraki in Season 1. Armor is valuable. Yeah. So start wearing it. Or just aim for the throat. Right, yeah. Sticking with the pointy end. That was John's advice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of sounds dumb by comparison. Different teachers have different ways of getting across a point. <laughs> All these other complex <laughs> ideas, John. Straight, straight to the stab point. Stab him. No nonsense. <laughs> I love John. Your friend's dead, and Meron Trant's not. Because Trant had armor and a big fucking sword. A nice little fact about this scene, too, is that it's the last scene that Pedro Pascal filmed for Game of Thrones. Oh. This scene with him and Cersei. And he says at the end of the walk, when they were done filming, he just jumped into the water and everybody was really jealous. But I really like this scene. It kind of does more to humanize Cersei with the way she's worried about Marcella and talks about her. It's kind of a continuation of that moment she had in Marjorie talking about her children when... We really don't hear much about Marcella, but you could tell that she's always on her mind. Yeah, and it is similar to the scene that Tywin had with Oberyn, where Cersei, even though they are on opposite sides here, that both of their families loathe each other, she can respect him for what he is. A great warrior, a great mind, one of the most revered and feared individuals in Westeros. And also a poet? He's got bars, man. Yeah. I hate. I always hate to when every time they bring up, oh, we don't hurt little girls in Martell uh, and Dorne. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. That was... Good in theory, but, you know. Well, it still rings true for the books. Yeah. And I think they... Hold on to that. At that point, I think that's where they were still going, because he mentions the Sand Snakes here. And it's always interesting when you get into how the Dornish people treat their women in society, that if it's a woman, if Dorn was to die, then his daughter would succeed him. Just the difference in culture that they have to the other kingdoms. And they also discuss this idea of power, how if you have all this power, but you can't protect the ones you love... Is it even worth it? And Oberyn brings up the point that they can avenge them. It's kind of interesting to hear that, and then we fast forward to when Cersei does, in fact, lose everyone she loves. She kind of just takes the power and even and even ostracizes the one person that still might love her, and Jamie forces him to leave town. Yeah, that Cersei loves her kids so much that when Tommen killed himself, she was like, well, he betrayed us. What a great mother. You can't let... <laughs> Can't let children come in the way of objectivity. That is true. That's a good point. Yes. Oberyn wouldn't do that either. Parenting 101. What do you think his poem was? I don't know. Roses are red, violets are blue. Who gave you the order? Was it you? Oh, yeah. man, that okay. worked. That did work. We, I went into that thinking, we're not getting anything out of this. It's going to be on the, <laughs> on the chop block. We're opening with that. Are you kidding me? No, no, we'll keep this here. Okay. And then the last 15 to 20 minutes of this episode is exclusively in the north. And it begins with Locke, and he's kind of scouting out the Night's Watch mutineers. He's trying to figure out his plan. But he also discovers that Bran, Jojen, and Mira are being kept prisoner. And credit to Locke. Locke is a very smart guy. He has these tracking abilities. He's a great assassin. And he's able to deduce that is Bran Stark. So he goes back to camp, and he says, yeah, we got these dudes. But don't don't go over there. They're dogs. The whole whole thing going on there. It's like, <laughs> but we're gonna charge them and make a lot of noise. So it doesn't matter if the dogs are barking. Because <laughs> when they do charge them, there's like the Night's Watch is here and they should all come running at them. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. So a couple of barks, but yeah, Locke. Good job. I kind of always forget too when I was rewatching this. Like, oh yeah, he's he's Locke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he is Locke. He did a good job of convincing John and me. Like, oh. Maybe. Well, I'm I'm so happy that John that Locke died without John knowing his true purpose. So that he can keep Locke close in his yeah, heart. Yeah, good Locke. When John's on his deathbed and in like 40 years, it's like, and that Locke. 
<laughs> that came with us north of the wall. I couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> Never forget Locke. <laughs> this is a great scene, too, where Jojen discovers where they must go north of the wall. Bran had already discovered it earlier in the season. He sees the Three-Eyed Raven's cave under the Great Werewood Tree. But the way that this is shot visually, where he looks over to Bran and Bran, you can see the tree in the background. With the fire in his hands. Right, right. He's talking. I know about a lot of people about it. Like, what's what's going on there? They thought it was like actual. It's just it's in his head. Yeah, just yeah. having his uh, freaky visions, but and it's kind of bittersweet too. Watching this, like how he's still optimistic and wants Bran to reach his destiny, but he knows he's toast. Yeah, it is. It is kind of sad. He says, "This is not the end, mm-hmm. not yet." And that's when his f- hand does become engulfed in fire. And I think that's as simple as it's going to be the battle of yeah. ice and fire. And it's just a nice visual representation of. What's going to happen to everybody who's dead and then brought back to life? The yeah. fire is going to destroy the whites. Jojen doesn't get enough credit. I mean, he's basically, he knows this journey is going to kill him, but he knows it's for the greater good, so. Yeah, he's got that, Um, he's he's similar to Bran in season seven, where he's kind of got the weight of the world on his shoulders, but he never lets it get to him. It's just pure objectivity throughout. And I think the name Little Grandpa, it's so fitting for him because he does have that Maester Lewin type of wisdom. And this nice scene between them is kind of ruined by Carl, who's coming to assault Mira, of course, because, you know, they don't have enough of Craster's wives to assault. Might as well just come add Mira to the mix. Yeah, he really is the worst. It's like, yes. oh, because whenever you bring up Carl Tanner, it's like, oh, Carl fucking Tanner, he's a fucking legend. It's like, yeah, he's also a fucking he's also human a piece of fucking, fucking garbage. Rapist. Yeah, yeah. It's just, I always love the moment when Jojen kind of checks him when he has Mira and he's saying all these different things. Like, oh, do you see what I'm about to do to your sister? He's like, no, but I see you're, di- you're dying tonight. <laughs> yeah, and to credit to Jojen that he's able to stand up to him. And I mean, I guess he has the advantage of knowing that Carl is going to die. But it is a great interaction between them. And I said I love this actor who plays Carl Tanner. And even when he's doing these evil and despicable things, you could still enjoy the performance because he's a bastard and you want him killed. So that's why you're cheering for Jojen when he says this. You're like, yeah, Jojen, get get this man, old grandpa, little grandpa. I see you, boy. I still love that nickname. It's probably my favorite. It's the best Game of Thrones nickname by far. (laughs) And yeah, the Night's Watch comes and... They charged in. Yeah. They ran. That's the definition of running up in the spot. No <laughs> yeah. fucks given. Jon Snow with, I love Jon Snow when he leads a charge. Yeah. It's, he's someone you could fight for. Oh yeah. hundred percent. He's got the crew and it's just, it's a cool battle sequence and you have the showdown between him and Carl Tanner. Yeah. It, it is a good showdown. It's, it's, it's always well choreographed. The battle sequences in the show, they always feel so real mm. and you, you feel every stab and every death. But before that, Locke stumbles upon Bran and Mira and he says, oh, the rescue party's here. Just kidding, I'm going to kidnap you. (laughs) And I guess the idea was to kidnap him and bring him back to the Dreadford. He's more valuable if he's alive. Yeah, he's not the ones to make those split decisions whether to kill Bran or not. So they probably had this planned out before. You bring him back if you can. And I love this too when Bran gets into Hodor and Hodor fucking beast, man. Breaks out of those chains, tracks him down, and snaps his fucking neck. And... After he unwargs him, Hodor's like, what the hell did I just do? He's terrified. What just happened? The outside looking in, he, he doesn't seem like the smartest individual, but it's just a very human feeling of just not knowing, and no one will. You, Anyone gets warged into them, and their brain must be going a million miles a minute, and you see what just happened. You did it, but you don't know what or why it happened. Yeah, and he might be almost reliving the trauma of knowing that he's going to die, too. Because this would technically be the third time that Bran is warged into him, because it happened to him when he was a child. It happened to him earlier in the season. No, it happened to him in episode 10 of season 3. It's a, it's a brutal death for Locke. And then Bran sees John in the midst of fighting, and he's calling out for him. Yeah, he realizes that there's much more at stake here. And, you know, this has been his calling ever since his fall. The only thing he really had to hang on to was the mystery of the Three-Eyed Raven. So, as much as you want to be with your family and see John again, you kind of have to make that tough decision. You could see that longing in his eyes. And for so many characters in this show, whether it's the first time you see Daenerys, when Jon reunites with Sansa, they all just want to go back to that peaceful life. And they're so young, too. I mean, Bran's just a fucking kid. I mean, how old is he at this point? What, 12? Younger in the books, I think. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah probably the around, book's even younger. Probably around that age. The way that they have to mature and just grow up, it's, it's sad. And it's funny that Jon didn't listen to Oberyn's advice here. Long sword is a bad option in close quarters. I'm surprised he even lasted that long. Credit to Jon. Hell of a fighter. Eh. Carl's got the advantage here with those knives. It's no Carl Tanner. Well, maybe you give John a couple knives. I always held on to the belief that John's always been a very capable fighter, but I kind of like that he isn't. Well, I kind—I of, guess they kind of change that later on when Ramsey's talking about the legendary fighter that is Jon Snow. 
I keep hearing stories about you, bastard. The way people in the North talk about you, you're the greatest swordsman who ever walked. Maybe you are that good. Maybe not. But I always viewed, viewed him as a very capable fighter, but, you know, he's not gonna, he's no Jamie Lannister, so to speak, so it's... I it's like all, a Michael Red. Yeah. He made a couple all-star teams. He's good. He's capable, yeah. He could uh, be your third best player on a championship team. <laughs> yeah. And it's kind of like the all-star, like Rob wasn't a great fighter, Ned wasn't, but there was just something about him where it didn't really matter all too much. John obviously has to do more. It's, he's put in these situations where he kind of learns quickly and he becomes uh, what he is later in the seasons. But, you know, I don't mind him taking an L right here. No, I don't mind him taking an L. And it's also their different upbringings where Carl Tanner is explaining to him, oh, you fought in the castle, you were taught by a master at arms. You didn't learn how to fight in the gutter. You didn't know how to fight dirty. And I think it's a lesson that John kind of learns more in the books too because John John is less honorable in the books than he is in the show. He makes decisions that would be frowned upon by somebody like Ned. So I think even this moment with Carl Tanner teaches him that sometimes in order to win, in order to save somebody like that innocent girl that's lying on the floor. Well, yeah, he learns yeah. quick. Yeah. Yeah. Because he impales him back of the head. That's not honorable. It's a great shot. Makes though. a hell of a scene. That's brutal, man. That's, that's a brutal death. Taken from, I forgot who, was it Was it Biter? Who was attacking Brienne, and I think... Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. It was Gendry, right? He, he does that? Yeah, Gendry, when he say it's in Feast for Crows. Yeah, so that's a nice little nod over there, but you see he spits in his eye and kind of trips him. That's, come on, Carl. Yeah, he's fighting dirty, and the choreography for this fight is great, too. I love the way that he fights with those knives when he's chopping them up. It's like, come to take me to trial. Maybe don't turn your back on the guy who's trying to kill you. <laughs> That's another trope in fiction, when you think that you beat somebody and then somebody else comes and hits you, yeah, and then it could you be, turn towards them. Maybe they're kind of trying to play with the fact that... Good move by the girl, though. They might be trying to play with the fact that Carl thinks John's too honorable to do something like that, so it's kind of showing John breaking that honor, or it could just look fucking cool. <laughs> no, I, th I think it's a little bit of both, that he is a fast learner. I have to play dirty? Okay. How does this Valyrian steel taste, bitch? Rest in peace, Carl Tanner. Probably sure he lost his ability to taste... I don't know. Yeah, probably. The way that he dies, too, and flops to the floor. <laughs> he looks fucking dead. That's very convincing. <laughs> but there's one last person that they have to kill before they leave. Because they come out, they count the bodies, and they say, there's ten mutineers, Locke told us there were eleven. And then we see Rast running away. And they know it's Rast. <laughs> Gren's like, where, where's Rast? And this is done very well, too, where he's looking around, he's kind of hearing things in the woods, and quick turn, there's Ghost. Yeah. Yeah, what's up, motherfucker? Ghost is back. What's up, motherfucker? I guess Bran freedom. Yeah. Yeah. It's always nice when we see ghosts and they have a nice reunion with John. You got to hug him. What's yeah. this little What's pat on the head? You got to do like a... Uh... I would have been rolling around in the mud with him. I mean, you see Poe and BB-8? That's a reunion. Yeah, that's a... BB-8, my buddy. John's like, come here, boy. <laughs> Let me give you two solid pats. It's like a very stark... It's <laughs> tough love. <laughs> Yeah, the CGI for the Darbles, and we always talk about how they're blending the line between cinema and TV, but it's like, they it's like, look so real. Going back to that, it's kind of like when Ron Swanson, I forgot to play the clip, and <laughs> Okay. Goodbye, Ann. I have enjoyed parts of our time together. <gasps> oh, God, Ron! <laughs> That's what I feel like Ghost feels like with a John Tupat, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, he doesn't Tupat a lot. No. Yeah, he's John's more of a... Hard grab on the shoulder. Yeah. You know? Or a nice forearm shake. My brother. The two pat. Very gentle, very smooth. Oh my god, John. And they're the best duo. He's the best Stark. He's the best Direwolf. I love John. He's better than Rob. Some might say that. And this scene too where they we talked about this in a previous episode that just the decision to burn down Craster's Keep, just to burn down all the memories, all the horror that happened here, and that the women, the Craster's wives, they're willing to go out on their own and just find their own way because the Night's Watchers caused them pain, Craster's caused them pain. Maybe the White Walkers will hook them up? <laughs> well, I mean, all they've known in their lives is just misery. So it's kind of makes sense for them to try to get by on their own because their previous engagements with other people haven't gone so well. So, you know... It can't get any worse, so why not? Let's try it ourselves. Let's survive ourselves for once in our lives. We can do what we want. And Jojo was right that the snow was falling on Carl Tanner's bones, burying them. And it kind of just buries the memory of Craster, and we'll see what that implicates in the books and the show if Craster's role goes back to the secrets of the Long Night, the relationship between the others and the First Men, the decision to sacrifice babies to the others, how important that is going to be. But it's, it's kind of the final straw of the others reproducing. 
It's kind of weird. Like, how did you figure that out? That, that's what I love what about came the first, show. The yeah. baby in the forest or the White Walker? Yeah, yeah. That's a good that, point. That old age question. <laughs> that age old question. Chicken and the egg of Westeros. Yeah. The baby in the White Walker. That's what. That's why I like these mythologies because it's fun to think about how did Craster figure this out? It was probably just luck. Probably just stumbled upon a bar and the White Walkers were like, man, if only we could reproduce. And Craster's got his son. He's like, God, I hate this son. <laughs> I don't want to be a father. <laughs> Something like that. Handshake agreement. Very uh, old school, gentleman-like. <laughs> yeah, Craster and the Night King. <laughs> yeah. Two gentlemen. The handshake means nothing anymore. <laughs> it really doesn't, man. Back in those days. It was tra- everything. Trade a baby for some peace. <laughs> All right, so this is an episode that I would probably give it a 10 out of 10. <laughs> You're the fucking worst. But in the context of season four, it's, um, I would say it's like an 8.9. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, you like that? It's good. You like that number? I like the decimals. It kind of helps differentiate. Yeah, it's a good episode. I mean, like you said, the first four seasons are nearly flawless. Some are slower than others, but they're needed. And it was a very character-driven episode until the end. You got a nice little battle. It's a nice mix of the two elements that make this show great. So, yeah, very solid episode. What do we got next week? Uh, Detective Pikachu trailer breakdown. It's going to be 50 minutes. <laughs> I'm going, we're going over every single frame he's of a, that trailer. He's a cute little thing. He is. a. Just look, I just want to eat that guy. Whoa. You know, in a cute way. Like, oh, look at those cheeks. I can just eat you up. <laughs> Excelsior. <laughs>